Hello and a welcome to this webinar on finally achieving a deep state of meditation. I'm excited to begin, uh, but just I'm just checking to see that um, people, there's still people joining us. Hi Luke, hi Rebecca, hi Dagmar, I can see Jenny, yep, good. There are still a few people joining us, uh, but uh, they can uh, join in as we go. So just want to check, you can hear me okay? Just say hi if you can hear me okay. Great, thanks Deborah. All right, so let's get going, shall we? In this webinar, I want to talk about um, finally achieving a really deeper state of meditation because I know that a lot of you have been meditating for some time and have tried lots of techniques and um, if you're like me, and I, I had this issue for many years, you get to a certain stage and uh, you know you still have distractions and you know you get some benefit for meditation, but you can never get to that really deep state of where you're totally transfixed on the object and you're just motionless and you can feel that state of bliss going through you so that you know you don't want to move for like you know, many tens of minutes at a time and that really is a fantastic uh, deeper state of meditation to get into you can feel the like the healing going on in your body body when you're in that state and the stress just sort of melts away and I was like that for many many years and I know that uh, many of you also when we try uh, sort of the more surface and the guided meditations you can get to a certain level but not go to that level. So look, the key is to follow the structure. Now there are so many different types of meditations out there and, and all of them are very, very good. But some of them are for more advanced practitioners and some of them are for more uh, beginner practitioners. And you have to know the structure of how to take your mind ever deeper. And then you need to apply the, the meditations that help you at that particular stage. So, so in what I'll be teaching you is the nine stages of meditation. And so if you're only on stage one or two, there's no point in uh, doing a meditation which is sort of say for a stage four or a stage five level meditator. And uh, instead, you need to really stick to the basics and get that foundation right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be taking you through a, a couple of structures. The first is the four foundations of mindfulness, which was taught by the Buddha. And the second is a, a very useful guide, which is the nine stages of meditation taught originally by a Sangha in 500 AD. So it's been around for thousands of years and it's been helping people for thousands of years. So we know that it works and it worked for me. Now, I still remember the day when um, I just had that realization because for years I had done several, uh, lots of different meditations from different traditions, Hindu traditions and Buddhist traditions and uh, I'd done research in psychology and mindfulness and I've done uh, mindfulness-based practices. But again, I, like you, were uh, got some benefit but never really got to that benefit. And <clears throat> I actually found out about a, a Tibetan uh, teacher here in Australia uh, who was doing a 10-day retreat. And I'd heard really good reviews. Friends of mine had been and seen him and said he's just the most amazing teacher. And he's done himself uh, he'd already done a three-year, three-month, and three-day retreat, which is sort of a traditional retreat that uh, the Buddhists do in uh, Tibet. And, you know, that's a huge amount of time doing meditation. So I took a leap of faith and I flew on the aeroplane over to Canberra to go to his particular retreat. And one of the people that organized the retreat agreed to pick me up from the airport. So that was very kind and I took them up on the offer. And I'll never forget, I landed in that airport and I found this person relatively easy. But there, next to him, was Lama Chodak Rinpoche, the, the head, this, this famous teacher that I'd been uh, hearing so much about. And so I was deeply honoured and blown away by his presence there. And what was even better is it was more, it was an hour and a half to the particular retreat centre that we were going in. So I had an hour and a half of time 
to, to literally pick his brains and to ask him all my questions as we traveled in the car to this retreat center. So it was just one of those amazing things that happened. And at that time, I of course said to him, you know, I've, I've been meditating now for about 10 years. And actually by that stage, I'd already been ordained as a monk. So I learned a lot as a, as a monk in Thailand, living in a monastery. But still, I still hadn't got to what I believe was that next level of meditation. You know, and he, he just basically said to me, he says, look, unless you know the proper technique and you follow it sequentially, you're never going to achieve uh, the deeper states of relaxation. Um, and that was quite a shock for me. And so straight away, I was like, well, where do I learn this uh, meditation techniques um, and techniques in particular to purify the mind, to get rid of um, a lot of the habitual negative patterns that go on in our mind. And so, of course, uh, the whole retreat was about that and I learned an enormous amount and I went on and did uh, longer and shorter retreats and I practiced according to these methods that he taught me. And probably about two years later, I, I did a, a quite a long retreat and I was fortunate enough, uh, with his help, to, to gradually go through the various stages and put them into practice. And, you know, I, lucky enough, was to achieve uh, incredible states of, um, you know, real, one, not one total one-pointedness, but real fixation on the meditation object. And to, we, together with that, there's these enormous feelings of physical and mental pliancy that come that make you feel just incredible. And um, that has really affected me the rest of, for the rest of my life. Uh, I mean, just being able to go into those states is amazing. But what was really interesting for me is that many of us want to get into those states of real tranquility and, and real bliss. And that's great in itself. But what I realized after that was a much more profound change had happened to me. Because I guess even though I was wanting to learn meditation and, and that, you know, what I thought was driving me was, you know, wanting to meditate as deep as, as the stories that I'd heard about these monks. But I think what was really propelling me was I was actually quite anxious. I was very socially anxious. I was and still are to a great extent an introvert. I do then tend to prefer my own time than chatting with other people. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think introverts are, um, you know, there's very a great many benefits to being an introvert as opposed to an extrovert. But nevertheless, one of the problems is that it comes often with a lot of social anxiety. And I definitely had that when I was young. I'm very nervous, you know, around, you know, ladies and around other people that I felt were more important. And, uh, through meditation and through uh, relaxation, I was really able to overcome that in a major way. Not that I'm a screaming extrovert, but I'm really much more comfortable around people and much more comfortable in myself. And I guess there's three reasons for that. The first is that when you achieve a deep state of meditation, well, knowing that you can go back into that uh, is great and and having that calmness if you if you can spend 10 or 15 minutes a day in in calmness in yourself that overflows so that you naturally are calm the rest of the day or, or whatever until then so that's why practicing meditation each day is very good but not only that just by knowing that I could go back to that state in myself in that happiness is an enormous sense of like not having to care about the world because I confidently know there is nothing in this world, not winning Olympic gold medals, not uh, succeeding in, in any respect, which will give me the state of happiness and tranquility that I can get in deep meditation. And that all I need for that is just to sit on the cushion and spend some time getting into that state. So it makes you much less worried about life. And then who cares? what other people think about you because you're not trying to get stuff out of them because they can't give you what you can give yourself. And finally, just the very process in itself, of course, gives you a huge enlightenment into your mind. And 
and you see that your fears and anxieties are really just ghosts projected by your own mind. Now, uh, you know, we know that at a conscious level, it's taught to us, uh, you know, people with phobias know that it's irrational, but it's very difficult, to, uh, one thing to sort of know it at a conscious level, but it's another thing to really get rid of it at an unconscious level. So I realized really that as an ongoing benefit, that, uh, you know, has helped me a great deal. And in fact, at the moment, I'm very busy in life. I've got three kids, I've got two businesses, I'm doing so many things, and I really haven't got the time uh, each day. I still meditate each day, but it does take more than 15, 20 minutes a day to be able to reach those very deep levels and I hope to get back into that at some stage in the near future but just at the moment that's not happening but that doesn't matter because uh, at a deeper level uh, I feel more calm. So that's just a little I went on a little bit longer than I expected <laughs> but um, that's just uh, a little wrap up of how I came to learn these particular techniques. So if you've been trying to uh, meditate for some time and you want to go deeper, then you know this, this webinar and, and what I'm going to be talking about later and how to go about it uh, is for you. Now I know what a lot of you are thinking, you know, I can't spend months and months and months in retreat. Well, I want to assure you that it's not as difficult as you think. And definitely, if you've been meditating for several years and using the wrong meditation, uh, then if you use these proper techniques in the proper order, you will get so much uh, more success much more quickly. You know. Uh, now, having said that, I'm not one of these people who promise you to meditate deeper than a Zen monk in seven minutes by just playing some special beats or whatever. Meditation does take a little bit of work, but if you know the proper techniques, you will gradually step deeper and deeper and deeper into your meditation rather than the sort of ad hoc way that a lot of us do it by trying this particular tradition and then this particular psychology and whatever. Uh, so it's definitely worth it. And you know, this isn't some new fad, as I said, they've been around for thousands of years. They've been working for thousands of years. So make an effort to understand these nine stages and I can assure you that you will definitely uh, make progress in your meditation. And I know I've had people who say, oh, I just can't meditate. My mind is, uh, my mind's just not suitable for meditation. Now, it doesn't work for me. Well, I know, I'm absolutely sure that meditation works for everybody. And here's, uh, I believe that if you're the person who says, oh, meditation just doesn't work for me, it's more of an excuse, you know, basically you're being lazy, okay? Laziness uh, and an excuse, it's just an excuse. I'd rather watch TV, so I'll just say that meditation doesn't work for me. So get over it, make some time available each day, and I promise you that if you uh, practice diligently, even just 20 minutes a day, you will progress in your meditation and you will eventually, if you're dedicated enough, you will achieve um, uh, deeper meditation states. Now, it will be really helped if you go on retreat as well because that those periods of intense practice can really help. But just 20, 30 minutes a day will definitely get you in the end. Starting off with just 10 or 15 would be great. So that's a little bit about the practice. How about we jump in, okay? All right, so let's talk first about the four foundations. Now the four foundations was taught by the Buddha. So it's, this is a, a really great background knowledge uh, to know. And the way he taught it was, he taught it with meditation of breathing, which we're going to do called Anapanasati, for those that want the technical name. Um, and the, the, the level of concentration you do, you, you change. Now, first of all, rather than meditating on the breath, it's actually very good to meditate on the body. And we follow the four foundations of mindfulness, which are mindfulness of body, mindfulness of feeling, mindfulness of thought, and mindfulness of phenomena. Now, the reason we go in that progression is twofold. 
because they are going from something which is easy to meditate on to something which is much more profound and difficult to meditate on but will at the same time take you a lot deeper. And it is a sort of a natural progression because when meditators start, they often have a lot of pains and itches and problems in their physical body. So if you've not sat cross-legged uh, or still for 30 years, you're going to find the body is not comfortable at just sitting still for long periods of time. So what happens is you get pains in the back and you get pains in the knee and you get itches on your cheek or whatever. And this is really disturbing to the meditation practice. So meditation on the body recognizes this and uh, allows us to just take time and allow the body to work through all its difficulties as it just slowly settles down. Of course, having a good meditation is really helpful to the meditation practice, a, a good posture. I mean, if you've got a good body posture, it's helpful to the meditation practice. So uh, that's another reason why we do meditation on the body, to begin with trying to get our body into a good, a good posture. Now, there are people who have bad posture who still meditate well, uh, but nevertheless, if you can get yourself with a nice straight back, you'll feel more alert, that sort of thing. So meditation on the body is good. Now, once the body starts to settle down a little bit, um, you're able to investigate these pains and problems. And what you find is that, of course, pain is a feeling. And so the, the problem is not the body. Sometimes these pains will go away as soon as you stand up. So the body's not in danger, and that's not the problem. There's pains that you feel, and it's the feelings which are causing the um, agitation. And the feelings can be split into two. First of all, there's the pain, but then there's the aversion to that pain. So there's, they're two separate things. If you have no aversion, you can easily sit with the pain, a huge amount of pain. And I go into this in detail in the in subsequent uh, videos that I'll be doing. And um, so that allows you to really start to, uh, first of all, get more used to sitting longer, but understand things as a deeper level. That is the mindfulness of feeling. Now, what causes us to have particular feelings? Well, it's judgments, or what causes us to have aversions? It's judgments caused by thought. We think, I don't want this pain, and that is an aversion feeling. So it is thought that underlies all emotional feelings. Feelings don't just arise by themselves. At some level, whether it's conscious or unconscious, there is some sort of a logical thought process or whatever, or unconscious process going on. And so that is the next level of, uh, that we look at, is what are our thought patterns and how are they affecting how we feel? You know, if we can just get the right set of thought patterns, we will feel tranquil and blissful. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's that simple on the one hand, but of course it's very difficult in practice. And then finally, at the deepest level, we look at well, what are responsible for the way we think. And it's the way we literally view the universe. It's the, our perception of our reality around us. So the deepest level is that's mindfulness of phenomena, how we perceive phenomena. So that's a, a really brief uh, understanding of that structure. And just to know in the background, we are following that structure as we go through the meditation practice. However, <clears throat> a thousand years after the Buddha, along came a very enlightened um, person called Asanga in India at the time. And he came up with something called the nine stages of meditation. He mapped out uh, what he knew of and, and all the people that he knew who had been successful meditators right up to you know the final stages and mapped it out, stage one, stage two, stage three. And this is incredibly useful. And so what I want to do in this webinar is to take you in detail through these nine stages. Now, I've already pre-recorded this because uh, I've got a little map which uh, it's represented by a drawing. So in a moment, I'm actually going to switch over to that pre-recording and then I'll come back into the webinar uh, to, to just wrap up and, and show you how to go to that next step. 
So um, I'm just going to, I hope this works. I've practiced it before, so it should work, but bear with me if it doesn't. So taking a look at this map now, the first thing you'll notice is that there's the meditator chasing the elephant. Now the elephant is black to start off with at down the bottom, because that's where we start. Stage one is down the bottom. And he becomes more and more white as he goes up the path. Now the black elephant represents our mind. And at the start, our mind is covered in ignorance, or we don't know our mind. And it's also being led by a black monkey, which is the restless of, restlessness of the mind. And what we want is more and more clarity. We need to understand the mind more and more. And this is done through the process of meditation. And we are the meditator. So maybe that you could consider that's like our conscious mind or our mind that wants to become clear and achieve meditation, deep meditation. Now this meditator, this the monk in this case, because obviously this is a uh, Tibetan uh, drawing, so it's the, the monk is the meditator. He has two tools at his disposal, and I talked about those tools before. One is a rope, which is the rope of mindfulness. So this is our, you know, most important tool and the one we spend nearly all the time working on. And the second he's holding up is a kind of a hook. So I guess it's a hook that the uh, mahouts use to control their elephants. But in this case, this hook represents insight. That is understanding of the mind or looking at the mind, actually peering in to find out what is going on in the mind. So that's our insight or our awareness. And we are chasing this uh, elephant, which is at this point totally out of control, just running amok in his or her environment. And we need to try to capture and tame this elephant with these two tools at our disposals. And he's being led by the very naughty monkey, which is destruction. So this is stage one. Now, at stage one, of course, when we begin to meditate, we've spent most of our life up until this point focusing on what's going on out there in our environment in our relationships, at our job, at our sport, whatever we do, we're ex focusing on the external world. But when we meditate, you know, for the first time, we are actually sitting down and looking internally to the mind. And one of the things we notice is when we try to bring our mind to the meditation object, at first, it's like we can't even spend more than about 10% of the time on a meditation object. And the rest of the time, our mind is totally distracted. How out of control are we in this mind? So this is where we see that we have an out of control mind. Now, the thing I like about this uh, map is it also goes into the benefits of each and every stage because there is a wisdom at each and every stage. And the wisdom of the first stage is are fairly sobering, that our mind is a little out of control. And I guess it's no wonder that we are having so many stresses and anxieties and problems in our life when we realize how out of control our mind is. But also when we think about it, every single person around us also has a mind which is completely highly distracted and out of control and being run by the various negative emotions or emotions in general and this distractive mind which goes from place to place. So we also learn to have a little bit of compassion for what's out there in the external world and the people around us. At least we have taken the initiative to try and understand and bring our mind under control. So we call this first stage of meditation, the stage of orientation, because we're trying to orient our mind to bring our mind back to the meditation object and keep it on the meditation object. Let's, for argument, say it's the breath. Now, as we do this, we 
gradually start to see the patterns in the mind. We start to see how distractive it is and get an understanding perhaps of some of the reasons why it might be so distractive. We listen to teachings like I'm doing now to understand a little bit of the mind. And that will eventually bring us to stage two, which we call repeated orientation. Now, at the stage of repeated orientation, we're trying a lot harder. And um, some of the other things that you'll see on the diagram, for example, are the flames. Now, the flames or the fire that you see on this diagram represent the amount of effort that we have to use to bring our mind to the meditation object. And of course, at first, we have to use a lot of uh, effort to bring our mind to the object. And in fact, in some of these paintings, not on this one, but on, on, on some, you'll see that at stage two, we're using even more effort. The fires are actually larger at stage two than, large, than they are at stage one, because in stage two, we have uh, decided we, we're going to get this thing. We're going to put in the effort and really try hard to beat this uh, distraction and get our mind into a more calm meditative state. And so this is repeated orientation. And we're trying to bring our mind back again and again and again from distraction to the meditation object. But it seems like the more we try, the more the mind gets distracted and we get frustrated at this. And the reason is, is because as we get frustrated at trying to bring the mind back again and again, that aversion, that negative emotion actually stirs up the mind and makes it harder to concentrate. And so at stage two, the lesson is really to, as well as bringing the mind back, is to not get worried or not get disturbed when the mind loses track and gets distracted. So you sort of get to the stage where, oh yes, the mind's wandered off again, bring it back to the meditation object again. And the more we can stay calm, no matter how many times the mind leaves the meditation object, the easier we find it is to bring the mind quickly back to the meditation object and the calmer we become. And that really solidifies us in stage two and brings us eventually to stage three. But in stage two, we are learning a lot. For a start, we're finding it easier to work with the body because we've been sitting for longer. We're often pushing ourselves in stage two to sit longer and longer. And we start to realize that the distractions come from very much from the mind. So if you hear an external noise, for example, then at first we blame the noise. But as we learn to have less aversion to being distracted by noise, we realize that it's that aversion which is the main reason for our distraction. And the noise just comes and goes and we can come back to the meditation object. So we begin to see that a lot of the distractions are in our mind. Now this has parallels also in life because as we see that distractions are in the mind, so too we begin to think to ourselves of all the problems that we have in our life, how much of it is created in the mind and how much of it is real. And we start to get an insight that our problems are only made into mountains because we're labeling them as mountains. And maybe those problems really are quite small and we can work through them fairly easily. So this begins to uh, show you that as you meditate, you get insights into how to stay calm in the rest of life as well. So we start to see that aversion causes thoughts and that by reducing aversion, then the distractions reduce and we can become calmer and we can eventually get to stage three, which we call repaired orientation. Now, the difference between stage two and stage three is that we are able to keep our mind on the meditation object for at least 50% of the time. So now rather than trying to bring our mind back time and time again, what we're doing is we're repairing any lapses in concentration on the object. So for about 50, 60, 70% of the time, we can actually maintain our 
awareness of the breath as it goes in and out, for example. And then we get distracted for a small amount of time and we bring our mind back. And you can see here that for the first time, the elephant is actually looking around at the meditator saying, you know, do you want to really know me? And in fact, he's becoming more white. The whole head is white and the whole head of the monkey is white also. And for the first time, the meditator has been able to get the rope of mindfulness around the neck of the elephant. So that shows that for greater than 50% of the time, the meditator is in, in control of the mind as opposed to in stage one and two, where the mind is effectively out of control and the meditator cannot decide where the mind should focus. It, the mind decides where it will go and in and of its own decision. So the other thing about stage three you'll notice is there's a little rabbit. It might be difficult to see, but on, on the back of the elephant, there's a small rabbit. And this uh, indicates subtle dullness. Now, as you can uh, put more than 50% of your mind or your concentration, uh, you know, you're spending it on the breath, for example, what happens is even though we can actually concentrate on the breath, we're not... Uh, over dullness and distraction yet. The mind can sort of get sleepy and you can feel lethargic and dull even though the uh, mind is staying on the meditation object. Or another thing is you can actually have subtle thoughts going on. You can be thinking about what a good lunch you're going to prepare in the background whilst most of your mind is still focused on the meditation object like the breath. So uh, this is represented by what we call subtle dullness, where you still have dullness or distraction, but it doesn't tear your attention away from the meditation object, like gross dullness and gross distraction. Um, so that's stage three. Now, as we're into stage three, we are getting more and more understanding that all distractions are internal that there's nothing out there that is really causing us problems. It, it is all mind-made. So even in a bad situation, if you can keep yourself into a positive state of mind, you can still feel calm and happy, even though bad things are going on in your life. You begin to be able to transform the way you look at the world. So whereas a person might be, say, shouting at you or whatever, you can start to feel a little bit of compassion that maybe these people can't help her. Or maybe, in fact, there's a lesson in it for us. Or maybe it's a good chance to practice patience with someone who's more out of control than us, for example. Either way, by looking at it from uh, different angles, you are able to maintain a level of calmness around distractions and problems in your life that you haven't been able to up until this point. So you start to see difficulties in a new light. And with this kind of befriending of distractions and befriending of uh, problems, then a new level of calmness begins to, begins to seep into your mind, so to speak. And that leads us to stage four. So as we practice, we get better and better, better and better at keeping our mind away from distraction and on the meditation object. And this is where we call close orientation. So now we're getting 80, 90% of our time, most of our time we're spending on the meditation object. And we're getting close to the mind being pacified, which I'll talk about in a moment. So at this point, even though our mind stays on the meditation object, we are still prone to subtle excitement or, or, and subtle dullness. These subtle levels of the mind wondering either getting too sleepy or getting too excited. And we need to increase the intensity of our meditation practice so that we can quickly get rid of any dullness or distraction when we see it. Um, and one actual tip here is up until this point we've been trying to lengthen our meditation practice, maybe from 10 minutes to half an hour to one hour, etc. And here we actually practice shortening the length of time. 
but we're dealing with subtle levels of dullness. And so we're getting rid of that rabbit uh, that is riding on the elephant's back. But as you can see, there is more white on the elephant, the legs are white, and the uh, meditator is getting closer and closer to the elephant. Now, in stage five, there's a big turnaround from stage four to stage five, there's a big development. And we call this uh, the change from orientation or creating calmness into pacification of the mind, where we actually start to see distractions and problems in our life so philosophically that not only do they not disturb us, we act, they actually create calmness in our mind. We can concentrate on pretty much anything. And the reason is because we're starting to see this idea as the idea that all problems in our life are projected by our mind. Now, these are the um, you know, subjects of the advanced module of meditation. And we'll be going to be talking about that in detail in the advanced module. But nevertheless, just to give you an understanding, at stage five, we're indeed becoming a very good meditator at this point in time. And we are actually being able to convert distractions into something which causes us to become more meditative rather than less. So now we've got very little problems because when the meditation is going well, it's, it's going well. And when we're being distracted, and problems are arising, that also helps us strengthen our meditation practice. So here we call it subdued orientation. So the mind is becoming subdued because the meditator is now, as you'll see, in front of the elephant. So another a big change. And the elephant isn't really using his mind, mindful rope of mindfulness much anymore because He's subdued the elephant so much that it's beginning to become tame. And he's just stroking the nose of the elephant with his hook of insight. So he's just learning more and more during each meditation session, which brings more and more clarity, i.e. more and more whiteness to the elephant, so that he understands the mind more and more, and it becomes more and more pacified, or more and more uh, subdued. He's becoming a master of meditation. At this point, he's totally over laziness and he's meditating, you know, even outside of formal meditation, he's meditating while he's on the bus or whatever. And at this stage, you know, if you get to stage five, you'll see very large changes in your life. You'll no longer be motivated by many of the things like greed or whatever that uh, drive most people day to day, you may find you want to change career into something a little bit more useful. So this is a, a really good stage to get to as we start to pacify our mind. And as I say, the difference between stage four and stage five is at stage four, we can get away from distraction, but we can't transform them. We can stop distractions by keeping our mind totally on the meditation object but when we think about them, they still disturb us. Whereas in stage five, even when we think about distractions or bad things that are in our life, they actually don't disturb our meditation practice anymore. So now let's go on to stage six. This is called pacified orientation. So here our mind is really totally pacified, so much so that the med meditator doesn't even need to look at the elephant anymore. You can see the monkey is behind, so the monkey, there is still movement in the mind, he's still there. The uh, subtle dullness and subtle distraction are completely gone, so the rabbit has disappeared. And the meditator is now looking out into his environment for ways to learn and to get better. In fact, the mind is so subdued at this point that very little in the meditator's experience causes many problems and in fact the meditator has to go out looking for problems in a way uh, you know he at this stage it's great if he finds some difficult people or some horrible situations in order to practice being even more calm in those difficult situations so that he can further pacify 
his or her mind. Um, and then that leads us on to stage seven, which is called total pacification. And, you know, this is really some of the, the greatest meditators. If you met a person on stage seven, you would almost feel the energy of his or her peacefulness. We're really working with the most subtle movements of the mind. It's getting very close to a complete calmness. And he's using every opportunity he can to work with obstacles and transform them into qualities of mind. He's totally unperturbable at this point. So you can bring any sort of distraction into view of the, the meditator and it won't disturb him or her at any point. He's unperturbable in his meditation and has incredible flexibility. So he can think of problems from all different angles and he finds a way to look at any problem in a way which gives him more resources and more calmness of mind. He's basically, med even in sleep, they're meditating. So they're meditating all the time. Even when a person sleeps, they go into a state of meditation on stage seven. Um, so here, the uh, meditator is saying goodbye to the monkey. So it's time to get rid of distraction uh, and restlessness, sorry, once and for all. And there's only a small amount of darkness on the elephant. So he's just discovering those last few remnants uh, to, to totally understand the mind. And that's, this leads us to uh, stage eight, which we call calm abiding, where he totally understands, he or she understands the mind completely, and it's a completely tame animal. And there's no problems whatsoever for someone who reaches this stage, stage eight in the nine stages of meditation. The only difference between here and stage nine is there's still some subtle movement in the mind. And like ripples on a pond, it's just really a matter of time before the mind comes to complete rest. And finally, at stage nine, there, are, uh, there is what we call one-pointed meditation, where the meditator can focus on the meditation object and no other thoughts come to the mind until he or she decides to get up and, and, and do something else. So this is complete meditation, and this is where people can supposedly meditate for days or even months on end uh, in a cave, the highest point of meditation you can achieve. And then because this is a, uh, a diagram from a Buddhist tradition, uh, we have the, the uh, meditator go riding on his mind uh, to Nirvana, in this case, and then coming back to try to help and teach other beings with a, with a sword and with lots of flames and lots of effort to help others. Now, just for completeness of this diagram, you'll also notice there's some other symbols going up the path. The first, uh, the red one at stage one is, is, is cloth, which represents the sense of touch. So these each represent the five senses. And um, because at the beginning, a beginner meditator is dealing a lot with the body and pains in the body. And so the sense of physical feeling is the biggest distraction that the meditator is working with. And then further up the path, there's a fruit, which represents taste, a conch shell, which has perfume in it, which represents um, smell. So tastes and smells can be a distraction for the meditator at early stages. But by about stage three, we are getting over the uh, worry of small pains. Our body has settled down. It's usually sitting for longer periods quite well. You're not so much worried about uh, food or smells that come your way. But still, sounds are very distractive. So even at stage three and stage four, uh, sounds, which in this case is symbolized by two symbols, like symbols that you, you clang together, um, cause, dis cause us distraction. And then the most sensitive part is our sight, and that's represented by a mirror way up at stage uh, six, and so, or even seven. And so the eyesight is a very distractive nerve, and so if something happens out the corner of your eye, your mind 
necessarily just goes to it and gets distracted by that. And so that sense is not overcome until about stage seven on the path. So that's, that's just for your completeness um, in the diagram. I hope you enjoyed that explanation of the nine stages of meditation. And even more so, I hope that it really inspires you that there is a path, it's actually a well-trodden path, to advance in your meditation practice. And it's absolutely worthwhile to tread that path and to become better, a better meditator. So, okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed it. It seems to have worked. It seems, I think uh, everyone's seen that video now. So uh, welcome back. And I'm glad most of you are still here with us. And um, look, I just want to, I've taken the time to sort of bring in a little whiteboard to tell you about how to go to the next step. But before I do, there's a couple more vital things which I think are really important for you to also have if you are wanting to take your mind to that next level. Now, the information on how to do it is the first step. The practice of it is the second step, but invariably they're going to be questions and there's going to also be a, um, you know, we need to keep you as motivated as possible. So there are two other ingredients which you uh, should try to put in place before or as you're going to try to, um, if you're really totally confident about trying to uh, increase your meditation practice to reach those states of bliss. Now the first is some sort of a mentor, someone who has done meditation before and is maybe several stages ahead of you. So I love to answer questions. I am definitely nowhere uh, near the end. I mean, I'll, I'll put that straight out there. I'm definitely not in, far from enlightened. I still have a lot of practice myself to do, but I have spent many years and I have had the fortune with good teachers, I will say, to uh, be able to achieve uh, some of those uh, later stages of meditation. So I can definitely turn back and, and help that. Now, you may have mentors in where you live, and that's great. But to have that, uh, you know, it could be a teacher or whatever, someone that you can ask questions to um, about what happens when things go wrong or when things are a bit confusing is a, is a huge help. So that's number one. Now, the second things are put in place to help you achieve uh, the deeper state of meditation is a support community. Motivation is one of the key aspects, especially in the beginning stages. It's so easily to get discouraged if you have, uh, you know, you go through a few sessions where you don't get any progress and then there's all these externalities knocking on your door and saying, oh, this is far more important than your own uh, mental practice. And so by having a group of friends that are all in the same alignment or in the same wavelengths as you that are also meditators, that is going to be a great deal. Now, these people don't have to be any better. They, they can be worse meditators than you. It doesn't matter how good they are. The point is where if they are motivated and you see them regularly, then this, this support is going to be so helpful in you moving forward. So I want to create a movement. Um, I already have uh, classes and that around where I live and I want to expand that movement to include you so that you, if you're uh, keen to join us, can help move forward in your own meditation practice because I know that if you can get uh, to uh, a deeper state of calm and tranquility and kindness, then you will definitely influence the people around you. So what I want to do is I want to put together a, 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 like a membership package. Um, now, of course, I do need support with this, um, but we want to put something that will uh, give you every single chance that you need to take your meditation practice to that next level. And of course, the basis of that is uh, all the lessons or the, the training. So I've gone ahead and I've created videos, videos on the four foundations and the nine stages, which show you incrementally what to do at, 
at the beginner level of uh, learning to meditate. You know, as you're getting a little bit more experienced, right through and um, right through all the stages of meditation. And I tell you, you know, you don't uh, at this stage don't use those meditations. Use these meditations. And then as you progress, you'll need to change it up a bit. So that's that's training in the four foundations. And the nine stages. And these really form the structure and the technique for anyone that wants to learn. You, you have to really know this if you want to progress in your meditation. I'm just absolutely confident of, of you. Unless you're very one of these very lucky people who do have epiphanies just out of the blue. Some people just become realized beings without even doing any meditation. But the majority of us will have to go through this step-by-step -step process. Okay, and what I also want to put in place is I'm, I want to make myself available. So if anyone have authentic questions, then please feel free to um, ask me. So I'm going to put in place mentoring and at this stage there's no limit. If whatever you want to ask me, whether you want to email me, whether you want to call me up or send me a message on Skype or WhatsApp, I promise to return uh, an answer to you or have a chat with you anytime if you get stuck in any questions uh, with regards to the practice or with regards to your own meditation. Now, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest, I charge $220 an hour for my coaching uh, for uh, my executive coaching and life coaching services. So this is, you know, I'm not doing this, um, you know, out of uh, any sense other than to try to help you progress in your meditation because I believe that is what's needed. Now, if at some point my time uh, gets busy, I, I may need to delay you or whatever or change that around. But at the moment, you're free to contact me at any time. But further to this, I want to encourage you to also get into a community. Now we have leaders, we have classes, we're starting to get them all around the world. So if there is a class in your city, then I'm going to give you a free intro session into whatever Skillful Mind class is in your city. So you can go ahead and meet the people that are practicing in your neighborhood. Now, just as an aside, if there's not a class in your city, then uh, in a separate area, we are looking for leaders. So if you've had some success in meditation and you don't have to be um, good at all, as long as you've got your own practice, we're looking for people who will facilitate groups. You don't have to have all the knowledge in the world as long as you're are uh, able to find a venue and host a time where people can come and meet and meditate together. And if there's one in your city, I will uh, make sure that you get uh, definitely a free session to go and meet those people. But if not, the online world is getting more and more connected and I will include you as part of an online community where we chat about these things and you're free to meet other people. So online community and one of the things that I'll do for you is to, to pair you up with an accountability partner. This is one way of really uh, ensuring that we uh, keep our promises is by having someone, and it can be someone across the other side of the world, that just checks in with you once a week and say, hey, how'd you go with your meditation sessions? And that in itself is really supportive of us uh, making sure that we do our meditation sessions. It's not done in a negative way. You're the accountability partner for them and they're the accountability partner for you. And that regular contact for, you know, forcing yourself to do that each week uh, is, is also so a partner. Now, I think that with all of these things, there is absolutely no question in my mind that you have to progress in your meditation practice. So if you're serious about doing this practice and getting to a deeper level of meditation, then, then this offer is really will be invaluable. 
But we do need support, obviously. And the other thing I know is that, you know, if you don't commit something to it, then uh, we then you will tend to let it go away. So what I want to do is put in a monthly subscription for you to join our little group here, our movement to take you and to take others through to a higher meditation. So now what is it worth to you? I mean, how do you put a price on having a mind which is happy all the time? I mean, people have suggested to me, you know, $10,000. Now, would it be worth $10,000 to you to be able to have a mind which can live in a state of bliss? Would it be worth $10,000 to you if you could have um, better focus, better creativity, deal with people better? Of course it would. I've spent well over $100,000 and I can tell you I, I would have spent, you know, double, triple that much to be able to achieve a mind which I can, you know, which I've successfully got over my anxieties and things like that. But of course, I don't want to do that. So I have thought about what is the minimum amount that I can realistically do that, that is at least a token that you guys could put forward. So I know that you're serious about doing this meditation practice. And look, I'm just going to do it for the time being. Just look, $10. So $10 a month, $10 per month to join all of this. I mean, you guys will have loose change, you know, in your pocket, rattling around of at least 10 bucks a month. And if only, you know, if nothing more than just being able to sit in peace and quiet, um, is definitely worth $10 a month. So I don't really want any excuses. Now is the time that if you really want to do something for yourself and do something for all of those people around you, then let's just jump in, join our movement, say hi to me, and let's get stuck in and learn how to meditate properly so that you can finally achieve those deeper levels of meditation where you can feel that sense of happiness and healing and bliss, just as many other people, including myself, have done so before. And maybe you'll go on to achieve heights even greater than me, greater than anyone. And you can then one day return that favor to all the people in your community. Okay, that's it from me. I look forward to seeing you on the other side. I look forward to chatting to you and all the best for now. Sign up below, put your details in, you know what to do. I'll catch you later.